Wonderful. So thanks for having me again uh, and for a topic that I find uh, really important. Uh, as jo Jonathan has uh, explained, introduced uh, the interaction between transition modeling and policy worlds. And I'm going to focus pretty much in continuation of, of my last intervention on boundary objects. So uh, objects that allow us to translate between worlds, uh, translate forms of knowledge, uh, insights and prescriptions between worlds. Now, these worlds being various research worlds that have uh, sustainability transitions uh, research, that of climate and global and environmental modeling and that of policy and practice. So this is gonna be mostly the structure of the talk. I'm first gonna introduce a context. So why uh, the interaction of sustainability problems and transformations, there are these challenges about uh, um, uh, modeling the future, about thinking in terms of trajectories and pathways. This is gonna lead me to uh, introduce and really go in depth into that notion of pathways, which is really central to transition studies. And I'm gonna to try to suggest allows, will enable forms uh, operating these translations between these worlds. The question of feasibility, which is I put here in question mark because it's one that is contested, uh, that is plural and should be in my view addressed in that way. And lastly, some more operational uh, issues about how uh, one can uh, interact with different uh, approaches, including modeling uh, for addressing these kinds of, of challenges. So these are the main publications, at least, the, uh, yeah, these are the main publications that I'll be uh, mobilizing. And there's a full list, list of reference as there was in my previous uh, intervention for your information and future uh, digging into. Uh, so mostly uh, research from the Pathways Project in which Jonathan was involved as well, as well as a number of, of transition scholars and uh, global energy modelers of the integrated assessment modeling tradition, uh, mostly based at PBL in the Netherlands, so the uh, Environmental Assessment Agency. So this was a four-year project where we thought a lot about, about these kinds of, of issues, as well uh, in research uh, sense, but we also interacted uh, primarily with one arena of, of uh, science policy uh, decision-making, which was the European Environmental Agency, uh, with whom we've worked quite closely on these issues. Uh, and I, I think we believe uh, we managed to really generate an impact into how these questions of transitions and transition pathways are taken up in the European policy landscape. So this is the science policy context. I mean, I, I'm sure you're very familiar with these issues, but I just wanted to reiterate them. You have these so the notion of, of uh, planetary boundaries, which are ways of representing uh, the space, uh, uh, so the, the global uh, system Earth and its relationship to global environmental problems. And in, with these colors, you can get a feel of where we are transgressing these limits. And in green, you get a feel for where we might be operating in, in safe conditions. Um, these representations and the next one from the European Environmental Assess Assess uh, Agency, sorry, uh, are the kinds of indicators that are really commonly used in policy making. So you have color colors indicating good or bad uh, progress, and you see on these two pictures that uh, whether we're looking at the short term uh, or the medium and long term, things are not looking that great. This leads me to the third uh, uh, policy report uh, to mention is this special report that the IPCC uh, issued in 2018. So beyond this usual regular publication uh, timeline to mark, to make a political statement about urgency of climate uh, issues and how they should take a center stage. And there, the issue of transformation uh, in all of these uh, arenas uh, 
is starting to take really uh, center stage. And I'm going to try to explain myself a bit. So what we see, in my view, is a shifting emphasis in these science policy con uh, contexts concerned with environmental problems, a shifting emphasis and a broadening of the scope of their assessment. So whether it's the European Environmental Agency, the IPCC, the IPBS for uh, biodiversity issues, um, we see a shift from a focus on the nature and the extent of the problem. So really looking uh, at the degradation, the state of the environment, the degradation uh, of these biophysical uh, indicators towards uh, clarifying how these indicators, these environmental biophysical indicators are linked to actual systems, to a search for solutions for changing these systems. And now there's pretty much global ag agreement in these arena, uh, uh, arenas about the urgency and the necessity for transformation. And so this leads these science policy arenas to want to engage with the kind of knowledge that we develop in transition studies about what these transformations are, what they entail, and how uh, we might uh, support them. So here a quote from the IPC, the, the latest, well, the last IPCC uh, global, uh, assessment report, stabilizing GHG concentrations will require large scale transformations in human societies, et cetera, et cetera, the way we produce, we consume. So really very much a framing that is compatible with the kinds of problems we ask in transition studies. So there's a clarity about why we need these transformations. And I think the next step, and I think that's what I'm gonna primarily focus on is the question of how, and, and this is where I see the science policy and modeling interactions engaging with. And it's very central in the upcoming IPCC reports. I really invite you to go and look at the website uh, of the IPCC. They already have the, the at least the table of contents uh, uh, ready because there are working groups behind these. And you can see how the questions that we as a community are addressing are taking really a much more important uh, position than they ever have. So uh, concerning the phenomenon, we have also a shifting problem context with a couple of emerging questions. So uh, questions concerning the phenomenon of transformations and, and transitions. So what are the attributes of these transformations? What kind of processes and mechanisms do they entail? Uh, we see a shift towards uh, uh, questions of an epistemological nature. So what do transitions look like? How can we know something about them? How could we recognize them if we were in the midst of uh, transformations? How would we know? That's, I think, a very important question that we uh, evoked, I evoked last time concerning indicators. The questions about operationalizing uh, these uh, issues. So can transitions, transformations be modeled? Modeled in, in a wide sense of made sense of, but also modeled in the sense of a formal model. What kinds of knowledge are needed, useful? We covered this last time. And how can this mob, uh, knowledge be mobilized? How should it be mobilized? And there are questions concerning governance. So how can we envision, support, or steer, or navigate transitions? What kinds of society do we want is desirable? These are kinds of questions that are bundled up with uh, uh, when transformation issues take center stage uh, in political arenas, in science policy arenas. And I will argue that uh, a transition perspective and bridging between a variety of approaches can enable highlighting, focusing on difficult choices, on political choices, and not escaping these uh, issues. Next, oh, sorry. So, uh, yeah, so now um, focusing on, on pathways. So uh, pathways, the notion of pathways and specifically transition pathways, I argue, I think, I believe, and again, I'm not alone in this, uh, are increasingly becoming a means to 
um, operate uh, at this uh, science policy arena to enable constructive dialogue between approaches and between these different worlds. So it is uh, emerging as a very central boundary concept and possibly an obligatory passage point as uh, Michel Caron would put it. So if we look at the dictionary, what is a pathway? A pathway is a way that constitutes a path, not very useful. It's a way of achieving a specific, a specified result. Okay, so there's this goal orientation, moving towards something. And third, it's a course of action. So it's a means, it's, it's starting to answer this how question. Daniel Rosenblum has reflected on the notion of pathways uh, in and around transition studies. He's defined it in this way. So the, ch it uh, the challenge of envisioning and moving towards desirable decarbonized future has increasingly been framed in terms of pathways. And yeah, I fully agree with this statement. So in these conversations, in these arenas, pathways are emerging as a political and a policy object, as a research object, as an object that mobilizes and draws and enables uh, a different kinds of knowledge and a multifaceted object. I'll come back to this uh, very quickly. So first, who, whose research worlds are mobilizing the notion of pathways? Let me just minimize this because I can't see the screen. Here we go, go back. Uh, so there are three big types of pathways in this uh, global climate change uh, science policy arena. So first, the biophysical pathways mobilized by mostly basically climate modelers. Uh, so people modeling uh, the climate from past observations and trying to predict future uh, uh, climate states, uh, also taking into account uh, societal uh, conditions and constraints. So their modeling, their understanding of pathways are long-term trajectories of greenhouse gas emissions linked to stabilization targets. So there are these different RCP uh, uh, pathways uh, that uh, draw up various kinds of futures in terms of uh, greenhouse gas concentrations. The second kind of pathways are these techno-economic pathways uh, that we see a lot in modeling, in mostly energy modeling, but also uh, more so, uh, more and more into sort of various kinds of sector model, transport models, et cetera, logistics models. So these pathways draw up techno-economic adjustments linking current sector configurations. So if we're looking at, the, for instance, an electricity grid, we're looking at the energy mix, uh, the fuel mix to generate uh, uh, electricity to future low carbon states. So we're getting from 2010 to 2050, a shift in the energy mix to produce electricity. There, the logic is mostly one of substitution and optimization. So this is very clear formal way uh, and methodology, but it's also got a lot of limitations. And then socio-technical pathways that we've talked about, socio-technical transition pathways, more as a heuristic, uh, as unfolding patterns of change within socio-technical systems. And here central notions are that of path-dependent innovation, path-dependent system change, the opening and closing, opening up and closing down of options as various contexts, uh, contestations, various struggles are open, tense, or are uh, uh, settled through societal and political choices, namely, sometimes technological. The notion of stepping stone, the notion of hybridization, so different pathways combine to generate a new pathway, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just to point you, it's, a, it's in the, the Rosenblum paper, there's three nice figures that trace sort of the histories of these various framings. So the biophysical framing, it's got an old history. The, I won't go into detail, but you can uh, uh, look that up in the presentation uh, uh, in your own time. Techno-economic uh, pathways have their own history. Socio-technical pathways uh, notions have their own history as well.
So back to socio-technical transition pathways, we've covered this as well. I mean, Jonathan has uh, mentioned last time that transitions are have these various uh, attributes, multi-actor, multi-scalar processes, disruptive, long-term, contested, and deeply political. They involve many uncertainty, they're non-linear and path dependence, and they involve co-evolution, so concomitant change in different dimensions. Uh, voila. And we can define pathways in or particular literature, literature in these two ways, so in this way. So pathways are historically informed patterns of change in socio-technical systems unfolding over time that lead to new ways of achieving specific societal functions, involve varying degrees of reconfiguration across technologies supporting infrastructure, business models, etc., cetera, et cetera. Voilà. So basically, a socio-technical transition pathway is a socio-technical transition along a particular path. And there are various ways in our community for representing these pathways. And here uh, in a paper by Leah, who's still with us, I'm sure, uh, she represents, she mobilizes uh, the typology by Gilles uh, Schott and, and puts them neatly into a, a comparative table. Uh, this is to show uh, primarily my point here is that in transition studies, we think well beyond substitution pathways, which is some a point where we epistemologically may clash with uh, modeling communities. On the right, top right here, uh, Andy Sterling shows how uh, thinking in terms of pathways uh, can enable different uh, political choices, different forms of deliberation, can open, and open up or thinking about technological trajectories, et cetera. And that at heart, uh, this is an issue of, of democracy. So pathways as a notion that can bring together different uh, approaches and disciplines that can bring together research and policy and pathways as a notion that is not purely one of formalizing, but also one of upholding the necessity for politics. So this leads us to the real question, how are these, path these pathways, if they are as plural as I'm trying to suggest, how are they used in, uh, in, uh, out there? I won't go through uh, the differences here, but in the, this 2015 paper, we really tried to stake out the distinctions the, so the, the striking distinctions between, on the one hand, quantitative systems modeling and socio-technical analysis. And here, without going into the detail, what we wanted to highlight is um, the potential complementarities between uh, these approaches. Uh, so beyond their obvious ontological and epistemological uh, uh, um, differences, there are points of connections and one can see some uh, um, advantages of one over the other for specific questions. So I don't know, Mohamed, I don't have much time left. I'm gonna to try to go a bit uh, quicker now. So now that we've introduced pathways, uh, I wanna just pause briefly on three facets of, pathway, uh, of pathways, uh, which we lay out in this paper with John uh, Newquist, uh, where we start thinking about feasibility. And here we're really working to, uh, against this idea of positivism around any notion. And really, we're trying to suggest that uh, we, we, yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying to escape this idea that there is one single answer to uh, any question, that there is one reality, and that instead one should really pluralize ways of looking at, at objects, and including definitions of these objects. So we can see pathways as representations of change processes that can support forward-looking evaluations. And I think the three traditions, uh, uh, regardless, do this to some way or another. Uh, so these pathways, they include in them, in their forms of representations, claims about the world and claims about how to understand it, how it should be understood. Pathways are also potentials. So they're hopeful, but put a question mark there because it could be also distressing and, 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 and uh, uh, 
terrifying, new orientations providing focus to change efforts. So for instance, an electric mobility pathway is clearly an inscription of uh, uh, an orientation. It's a, it's a bid for a particular kind of future. And these understanding pathways in terms of potential means that you're bounding the search and uh, uh, for uh, social technical development and for in, uh, innovation, and you're putting limits to the imagination uh, that you're bringing forward within your scenarios. And third, pathways can be seen as sets of conditions. So this comes back to the third uh, definition from the, the dictionary, it's a course of action. The course of action also entails decisions, decision points, branching points. So the conditions that can underpin the realization or not of such uh, potential. So there are various claims about the context in which a pathway can become, can materialize, can become realized, actualized. Uh, there are uh, uh, various uh, um, distinctions to be made about the kinds of decision-making style that can enable or not uh, one or the other pathway. And for instance, there's a big uh, uh, distinction between sort of techno-centric, uh, um, uh, highly bureaucratic, strong state, uh, uh, low carbon pathways versus uh, thousand flowers blooming pathways, which is very motiv motivated by civil society, for instance. Voila. So now quickly to think about pathway feasibilities. So uh, what is that? Uh, how can we think in terms of feasibility? So pathways are stylized journeys. They are representations, ideal typical representations of possible futures. They're not the actual material, uh, materialized future. In practice, we can expect realized transition paths to be inherently messy, to be full of misalignment and discords. And so we discussed this last time, but. But the real question is, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with this discrepancy between the ideal pathway and the way it reasonably might uh, unfold? And that's where the question of feasibility comes up. And I wanted to highlight that in the latest IPCC report, this, this 1.5 report, there's already uh, quite some, some advanced thinking about how we could uh, think about uh, how we should frame feasibility of pathways of low carbon future. So the first point that no single answer exists as to whether or not it is feasible, uh, that uh, pathways and futures and anticipations should, uh, and decision points should go well beyond yes or no answers. So it's not about binary choice, it's about really about pluralization uh, of, of uh, trajectories and potentials. And I think uh, Sarab will talk uh, much about this in, in a coming uh, session. And feasibility then provides a frame to understand the different conditions and potential responses for implementing pathways and options compatible with 1.5 1 .1, uh, uh, degree warmer world. And here I wanted to remind you of this, uh, this under, well, this, this word of caution by Andy Sterling that not all that is technically achievable and economically feasible or even socially viable is actually historically realizable. So this is the whole point about path dependency and, and surprises in historical developments. Again, highlighting the discrepancy between whatever forms of future pathway that we can envision, uh, that we can push politically, that we can uh, um, uh, sort of uh, contest uh, will uh, will necessarily have you know big discrepancy with with uh, what is realized uh, in the end. So what are then more feasible, more realizable pathways? Since we cannot uh, uh, you know uh, predict uh, realized pathways, we might think about more feasible. Uh, bringing them closer towards a point of, of achievable. So we can think about how to evaluate this. And what's important there is really to go beyond what the modeling, the conventional modeling community, uh, and still the IPCC is looking at relevant criteria. They look mostly at technically feasible in their own understanding, 
uh, uh, bounded understanding and economically achievable, again, within very specific uh, uh, cost uh, and, and uh, uh, cost and resource constraints. Um, but we could add uh, important dimensions. So are, for instance, technologies like carbon capture and storage uh, actually socially acceptable? Uh, are they technically uh, feasible, given that you know, smaller scales have been uh, developed in very particular oil reclaiming contexts, but not uh, uh, in the one that is envisioned in climate models? There's a huge debate, there has been for five years now, on the role that negative emission technologies plays in future energy uh, and climate models, uh, uh, pointing towards perhaps an over-optimistic outlook of these primarily modeling and economically uh, 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 driven uh, forecasts. And so the call here that I well, that we think is a relevant direction for uh, transition studies is to uphold this diversity, this plurality of relevant dimensions and of, of uh, possible futures uh, in uh, thinking about uh, feasible and ultimately more useful pathways. So invoking different rationalities, different political and societal choices keeping it complex again, as Andy Sterling would suggest. I will skip this because I see that I'm really out of uh, time, but this, uh, once we start uh, thinking about uh, uh, pathways in these three ways that I've suggested, representations, potentials, and conditions, uh, we can think about pathway feasibility accordingly. So. Uh, but I will skip this and uh, leave it uh, uh, for uh, your uh, personal uh, reading. Now, uh, because I wanna focus on this last point of bridging between approaches. So if the main claim is that uh, what we need uh, to do at these, in this arena, these arenas conveying, uh, convening various research uh, and uh, policy and practice uh, actors. If, if the hypothesis is that we need to convey plurality of perspectives in these arenas, convening these different worlds, then we need to pluralize the perspectives that we involve. And one way is uh, to pluralize the knowledge and the kinds of representations that we involve, so the various approaches, research perspectives convoked. The second related to pathways as potentials is to pluralize the different options and paths considered. Uh, very often in climate discussions, there is a lot of talk of pathways, but there's really only one or two paths. Uh, there's no reason for that. Uh, uh, and I think we really need to pluralize these. And we need to understand, to pluralize our understanding of the context in which these uh, pathways are supposed to materialize. Now, a more methodological point, how do we get different research approaches to um, uh, interact uh, productively, constructively, and potentially com complementarily uh, uh, to address these, pro uh, these uh, problems around the notion of pathways? Uh, I think there's three main uh, views about integration between approaches or between disciplines. There's the high sort of uh, strong integrative view. So this is basically building a world system model a bit in the way that uh, philosophers uh, uh, might or uh, might might do. So the idea is that by combining different knowledges forms of knowledge together and, and linking them in the right architecture, we will get a better understanding of the world. And there what is advocated is of really strong operational linkages between approaches. So the climate modelers have to integrate their data with the energy model, modelers who can then go to uh, people on the ground to get very detailed data about about uh, innovation dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
Now here, my view is that this highly integrative view is, is a bit illusory. A second view, which is the one I uh, advocate mostly, is a bridging view. So this is a, the idea that different perspectives have parallel, different kinds of explanations to, give, to provide, to bring to the table. They're equally, potentially equally relevant. And interaction would involve loose link, linkages between perspectives. And, and to do this in practice, one has to nurture an, an iterative dialogue. It's really time consuming. It's, it's, it's hard, but it can be also very rewarding around shared framing. No, uh, 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 it, 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 it's very important to not, uh, not avoid conflict because transitions do in, in, involve conflicts and tensions and just brushing them, pushing them under the carpet uh, is uh, in, in my perspective, no, um, no way forward. Uh, to the contrary, actually, conflicts and tensions are really enriching because they bring us closer to these really difficult points that will be social and political uh, uh, choice points. A third view is one of mutual enhancement. So for instance, a modeler in contact with the socio-technical analyst will learn something and vice versa. And, and I think this is also a valid way of interaction. Regardless, of uh, kinds of interactions, uh, these require a time and patience. Just going to show you a very quick overview because I'm well over time of how we've done this in the pathways model. So we had three perspectives. I'm showing you only two here. So in red, quantitative system modeling, in blue, socio technical analysis. And we conceived in between these of a bridging space, which is the, the space where these interactions uh, uh, will take place. And, and here with the various arrows, uh, uh, you see connections between uh, uh, workflows, uh, relatively independent and autonomous workflows of each approach. So socio-technical analysis and knowledge about past transitions uh, has allowed uh, modelers to better calibrate and parameterize uh, their models. Uh, a notion of uh, the current and uh, uh, future momentum of specific niches in a particular do domain allowed to develop a, a feasibility and a sense check uh, against the predictions that the modelers uh, uh, provided. But again, uh, but also uh, the scenario runs that the modelers developed uh, uh, triggered uh, socio-technical analysts, transitions analysts, to develop and to think uh, about the future, something that, is, that we often have difficulties with uh, the sort of long-term future and try to craft some histories of the future. So socio-technical scenarios about what likely decisions may enable or constrain uh, uh, these, these future states and the achievement of these future state, the states that, uh, that the modelers were uh, predicting. Well, and I, I think I'll, I'll leave it uh, to this. I just want to leave you again with a couple of questions which I think are relevant to all of us up to the whole session. So how are models and pathways useful? Can social scientists talk about the future? How much can be learned from the experience of modelers as epistemic community? Because they've gone the route of high integration, something that I'm a bit skeptical about for us as social scientists. What is actionable knowledge? We've discussed this last time. Is the IPCC, the science policy interface, the relevant one for pluralizing relevant forms of knowledge? Um, can social science uh, contribute in their own right to climate discussions or only as means to mediate, criticize, engage uh, with uh, existing and already embedded forms of knowledge? And uh, uh, how do we keep things open, keep things complex uh, in doing so. Thank you very much.